heartbreaker to France's Harmony Tan after a dramatic match. The 40-year-old Williams was targeting a record equaling 24th Grand Slam singles title. You're watching DW News live from Berlin. And uh, we are waiting at this point for a news conference with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg at the alliance's summit in Madrid. Stoltenberg has billed the summit as a game changer that will alter the alliance for years to come. NATO leaders are expected to declare Russia the main threat to their security. Also, Finland and Sweden will be formally invited to become members after Turkey dropped its opposition. And a Russian official says NATO was acting aggressively and warned expansion would be destabilizing. We'll be bringing you Stoltenberg's news conference live when it gets underway. That's expected within the next half hour. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has urged the United Nations to expel Russia as a member and label it a terrorist state. He addressed the UN Security Council after a Russian missile struck a shopping mall, killing at least 18 people. Russia claims it didn't target the mall, but fired on a weapons depot nearby. According to Ukraine, this was the moment a Russian missile hit, sparking a fire that left this shopping mall in Kremenchuk in ruins and dozens of people dead and missing. With rescue workers still picking through the rubble in the city far from the front lines, residents are in shock. Everything burned, absolutely everything. Like a spark, I heard people screaming. I don't know how to describe it. It shocked me, it was horrible. It's terrible beyond words. How many people were there? Rush hour, people were returning from work, lots of shops. There were always a lot of people in Amstor. Targeted, I think. But Russia's defense ministry claims it didn't target the mall, saying it struck this nearby building instead. According to Moscow, it was ammunition being stored here exploding that started the fire. But both Ukrainian officials and locals denied there was a weapons depot in the area. No, no. residential buildings, a shopping centre, a football field, no military infrastructure. On Tuesday, President Zelensky urged the UN Security Council to take action in response to the attack. It is imperative to deprive Russia of the opportunity to manipulate the UN. It must be impossible for Russia to stay in the Security Council as long as its terrorism continues. But with Russia holding veto power on the Council, there's almost no chance of it facing consequences at the UN for the destruction and death here in Kremenchuk. I spoke earlier to DW correspondent Nick Conley, who's in Kremenchuk, and I asked him to tell us more about the video released by the Ukrainian government that it says shows the moment the missile struck the mall. So that video, which seemingly comes from a security camera, shows a missile hitting. In the foreground, you see some industrial equipment stored. We haven't been able to get there yet. We're hoping to get there in the next few hours to see the direction from which it was filmed to make sure that fits the geography here. But certainly, if you talk to people here on the ground, locals, they point to the pattern of destruction behind me of this shopping mall. One side basically fully collapsed. They say that's the impact, whereas the other side burnt out. The Russian version is that a fire spread from the factory behind this mall and that it you know, spread to the, to the mall by mistake through detonation maybe of some of those weapons. The Ukrainian side dismisses that and points to the fact that there is quite some gap between the area of the factory that was hit and this mall, that those flames wouldn't have spread. So this is now a question of fact-checking. Lots of journalists on the ground trying to do those uh, calculations, get that information to be able to challenge those narratives. It is also important to point out that the Russians are coming out with lots of different and mutually conflicting versions of what, what went on here. Some pro-Russian media, Russian government media talking about attack on the oil refinery, which is 10 kilometers away. Others talking about an attack on the train station, which wasn't hit, that is also not far away. And then finally, some Russian top diplomats talking about Ukraine attacking itself to try and get sympathy and support internationally. So lots of different narratives coming out of Moscow, conflicting narratives, and um, seemingly, uh, yeah, an attempt to try and obscure what actually went on when went on here. 
Nick, we've seen several missile strikes uh, with deep inside Ukraine over the past week. The attack on that mall in Kremenchuk is the most deadly. How are people in Ukraine reacting to all this? Well, definitely it is shocking. It is scary for people who maybe thought that they are in some kind of safety here, hundreds of kilometers from the front lines. Definitely now where the fighting has kind of localized itself along the front lines and the attack on the rest of the country that we saw in the early part of this war has largely finished. But this is obviously a reminder that those air raid warnings are crucial, even if it's very inconvenient. Every day, basically, you have a couple of hours where those air raid warnings are in place. And most people trying to go about their daily lives, trying to earn a living, are just not able to actually spend all that time down in the cellar or hiding somewhere. But this is obviously you know, a painful reminder that if you ignore those warnings, that this is the risk and that there is no part of Ukraine's territory that is out of range of these long-range Russian cruise missiles. The Russian news agency TASS uh, announced that the Russian-controlled region of Kherson has begun preparations for a referendum on joining Russia proper. Could that mean, Nick, that Russia is planning to annex more Ukrainian territory? It definitely looks like that. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the war, you'll remember the Russians said that this was not their intention. They said that they were not uh, interested in occupying fighting bits off of Ukraine, that this was about denazifying Ukraine, whatever that means, and demilitarizing Ukraine. Now that is all long forgotten, and it seems like they are now trying to hand out Russian passports in these areas and you know, hold some kind of referendum like they did in Crimea in 2014, a referendum that wasn't recognized by anyone outside Russia as fair or free to try and justify taking that territory. Now, we don't have much more detail in terms of the timings when this is going to happen, but this is definitely a threat from Moscow, not only to Kiev, but also to the West. That Russia is willing to escalate. And if, obviously, then Ukraine tries to take those territories that Russia considers its own, then Russia might end up using nuclear weapons to defend them. So definitely willingness to escalate, at least in terms of the rhetoric from Moscow, very much in evidence. Nick, thank you very much. Our correspondent, Nick Connolly, there in Kremenchuk, Ukraine. Germany and the Netherlands have announced they'll send six additional howitzer artillery units to Ukraine. That's on top of the 12 dispatched last week. Germany also trained Ukrainian army personnel to use the weapons. Ukraine has welcomed the delivery, though some say these, these artillery, artillery units have come too late. Here's a close-up look at the new weaponry being deployed on the front lines. We make our way through bushes on Ukraine's eastern front line. In the middle of a patch of woods stands a howitzer tank from Germany. It's the first time the Ukrainian army has taken journalists here. This Ukrainian soldier just returned from Germany days ago. For more than a month, he was trained there. The time pressure for the troops is enormous because the Russian army is advancing further in the east. Many feel the arrival of these howitzers is long overdue. I think it's too late, much too late. Why? We should have been prepared before February 24th. It was known that the Russians would attack us. They'll never leave us alone. We should have been prepared in time. For weeks, they've been fighting a losing battle. One of the soldiers shows us a video of their operations with completely outdated technology. But that's about to change. Twelve howitzers have now arrived in Ukraine, seven from Germany and five from the Netherlands. Their location remains top secret. No matter in which army of the world, artillery is the first target for the enemy to eliminate, because this technology is especially dangerous for them. There's not much we're allowed to show on the front line this morning. The German army has told Ukraine that even the inside of the howitzer tank needs to remain a secret. They asked us not to film inside. They were afraid that the information about the technology would fall into the invaders' hands. On the tank, a provocative message to any Russian troops they may meet. That, too, is part of warfare. Let's take a look at some of the other stories making headlines today. Authorities in the Philippines have ordered the shutdown of an investigative news website founded by Nobel Peace Prize laureate Maria Ressa. 
Ressa and her outlet Rappler have repeatedly faced legal action over their criticism of outgoing President Rodrigo Duterte. Ressa said she would challenge the order in court. Indian police are on alert after the killing of a Hindu man in northern Rajasthan state. Protesters condemned the murder of a tailor by two Muslim men who filmed the crime and posted it online. Federal investigators are treating the killing as a terrorist incident. Restaurants in China's commercial hub Shanghai are reopening after the city's two-month coronavirus lockdown. Officials say diners have to present a negative PCR test taken within 72 hours. And patrons' dining time is restricted to 90 minutes. In Washington, a former White House aide has given dramatic testimony about Donald Trump's actions when rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol building. The aide said Trump knew protesters were armed and that he tried to seize control of a vehicle to drive to the Capitol. She was speaking at ongoing hearings into the events of January 6th last year. And then raise her right hand. Having previously sat for four closed-door depositions, this former White House aide was about to throw a political grenade into the select committee investigating Donald Trump's role in the storming of the U.S. Capitol. You may be seated. Cassidy Hutchinson told the hearing White House officials had been warned about potential violence and that Donald Trump was aware rioters were armed when they arrived in Washington, D.C. Ms. Hutchinson, is it your understanding that Mr. Ornato told the president about weapons at the rally on the morning of January 6th? That's what Mr. Ornato relayed to me. What followed was an excoriating account of an enraged president on the day of the Capitol siege. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Engel and Mr. When Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. He's there are more hearings to follow in the coming weeks, but this is the closest the investigation has come to the inner workings of the White House on January 6th, the day American democracy came close to collapse. In Texas, three men have been charged in connection with the deaths of 51 people who were found dead in an abandoned tractor trailer. The victims included migrants from Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. U.S. President Joe Biden said the deaths were horrifying and heartbreaking. DW's Washington Bureau Chief Ines Paul sent this report from the scene of the tragedy near the city of San Antonio on a route frequently used for people smuggling. Two water bottles, part of a spontaneous memorial honoring the migrants who were found dead in a trailer on this remote street just out of San Antonio. Fifty people died of heat stroke and dehydration, making this one of the deadliest border incidents in recent history. But it's not the first tragedy here, just 240 kilometers from Mexico. I feel sad, you know. Because those people come to USA to look for their dreams, you know. And some people find them and some people not, but they, they don't find that dream, you know. So they find them inside the, the trailer house, dead, you know. They come over here to the United States to make a better living, and they pay a lot of money to get here, and then people, you know, abuse them. Texas Governor Abbott put the blame squarely on the president, saying the tragedy was a result of Biden's open border policies. Technically, the border is still closed for most migrants, part of COVID restrictions that are still in place. President Biden finds himself in a difficult situation when it comes to migration policies. And this is dangerous for him because his challengers will make migration a central topic in the midterm election this November and also in the presidential elections in 2024. 
It's now been seven years since Paris was struck by one of Europe's worst Islamist terrorist attacks, which killed 130 people. All but one of the suspected terrorists died in the Bataclan concert hall and other locations in Paris. Today, a court is expected to deliver its verdict against the sole living accused attacker, Salah Abdel Salam. DW met some of the survivors who were following his trial closely. For the past 10 months, Catherine Bertrand felt she was in a parallel universe. She's a survivor of the Bataclan attack and still traumatized by that night's events. Now she has been attending the trial and sketching portraits of those testifying, including some unsung heroes. While listening to the civil plaintiffs, I realized how these terror attacks have impacted the lives of thousands of people. One police officer, Michel, arrived with his team at the Bataclan just after the attack began. They got everyone who was wounded outside. Then special forces got there and told Michel and his colleagues to go direct the traffic, although they were covered in blood. It was only when he testified that people heard how Michel helped people that night. He and his colleagues had never got any acknowledgement from their bosses. The court case has been hearing how the terrorist killing spree unfolded across the French capital. Only one of the ten attackers who were in Paris that night survived, Salah Abdeslam. He's become a focal point of the trial. In the past, I couldn't draw the terrorists. I was so unwell after the attacks that my psychologist and I decided I should just see the attackers as monsters. So I illustrated Abdeslam as a suicide belt with a beard. But as the hearings went on, I got more and more desensitized and suddenly I found myself drawing Abdeslam's face. It's like this court case has finally made me accept that humanity includes the best and the worst. A new courtroom was especially built for the mammoth trial, which has been symbolically important for France, says Arthur de Nouveau, himself a Bataclan survivor and head of one of the victims' associations. Through this trial, France has proven its strength, that its legislation, even before 2015, is sound enough to judge what happened that night. The court case really has shown that terrorism is a dead end and doesn't produce heroes. That might seem obvious, but some youngsters are still attracted to Islamic terrorism. I hope this will make everybody understand that there's no future in terrorism and such attacks need to stop. The end of the trial is an important step for everybody involved, not just because of the verdict. Those who are deeply implicated in the attack, such as Salah Abdeslam, need to get a harsh sentence. But the end of the court case also means I can finally be able to stop being a victim. I'll be able to turn to other things. That's a big step forward. What happened that night at the Bataclan will always stay a part of Catherine. But some of that weight on her shoulder is now finally going to fall away. You're watching DW News live from Berlin. I'm Terry Martin. If you're just joining us, we are waiting for a news conference with NATO Secretary General Jens, uh, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg at the Alliance's summit in Madrid. We're hoping that that press conference will begin soon. Stoltenberg has billed this summit in Madrid as a game changer that will alter the alliance for years to come. NATO leaders are expected to declare Russia as the main threat to their security. It was previously labeled a strategic partner. Also, Finland and Sweden are being formally invited as members of NATO after Turkey dropped its opposition. A Russian official said NATO was acting aggressively and warned that expansion would be destabilizing to the international order. We'll be bringing you Stoltenberg's live news conference when it gets underway. 
Now, a German court has sentenced a former Nazi concentration camp guard to five years in prison for complicity in war crimes during the Holocaust. The man, identified as Joseph S., was found guilty of being an accessory to murder. He worked at the Sachsenhausen concentration camp between 1942 and 1945. Hiding his face, but no longer able to hide from justice, former SS guard Joseph S. was wheeled into a courtroom to finally answer for his crimes. Nearly 80 years after the Holocaust, judges found the now 101-year-old man guilty of aiding and abetting the murder of thousands of prisoners in the Sachsenhausen concentration camp north of Berlin. Today, even the judge admitted that a sentence of five years in prison hardly stands in relation with the horrendous crimes committed in Sachsenhausen. For the family of the victims, though, that's not the point. For them, it was just important to stand today in a German court and tell the world about the loved ones they lost in that concentration camp. Over 200,000 people, mostly Jews, were imprisoned in the Sachsenhausen camp between 1936 and 1945. Joseph was alleged to have taken part in the mass murders there, playing a role in firing squad executions and in the deployment of the poisonous gas Cyclone B in the gas chambers. This trial sends a message. If you commit crimes like this, even 80 years later, you might be brought to justice. These trials are important in the fight against Holocaust denial and Holocaust distortion. And although relatives of the victims are relieved by the guilty verdict, some fear that because of Joseph's age, he may not spend a day behind bars. That's because if he appeals the decision, it could be yet another year before he goes to prison. But the families of those who perished hope the trial still sends a message that justice has no time limit. To northern Mozambique now, and a spate of jihadist-related violence that has displaced some 20,000 people just this month. Islamists have been attacking villages in parts of Cabo Delgado region that were long considered safe from such strikes. The region is rich in oil and gas, but investments worth billions have now been put on hold. Here's more from DW correspondent Adrian Kriesch. They just want to leave. Here in Ancoabe district, hundreds of people are waiting for a lift. Desperate to get to safety after several villages were attacked by Islamists in recent weeks. Many places are now deserted. The village of Muaja on the edge of the district has been spared until now. Residents are discussing what to do next. <laughs> We need to protect ourselves better. We need to check the identity of the people coming here. But we also want to welcome those people who are fleeing and take care of them. They have taken in 60 people from neighboring villages so far. They attacked our village. First they set fire to the villages close by. We were surrounded, but then we saw a chance to escape, so we ran. We survived, but they burned our houses to the ground. I'm just tired. My feet are swollen and hurt. We walked 30 kilometers to get here. We walked for three days, spent the night in the bush with our children. We are tired, but we feel much safer here. Until now, they have not received any support from the government. The insurgents have been pushed out their previous strongholds in the north of the province. And although observers say they are not as strong as previously, the attacks on villages around here is causing fear and panic. They are inflicting guerrilla-style warfare on communities that were previously considered safe. The attacks they took place in... Eight organizations fear that the conflict could spread. We were surprised that the conflict moved to the south that quick. If more population are moving to different places, you know, it's going to be more complex, I think. Yes, the capacity of the system is going to be, well, we will see. But I think, yes, we will, we will face some, some issues there. 
The largest secondary school in Montepuech is already at full capacity. Since the beginning of the crisis, the number of students here has doubled to 7,000. The school management has had to turn away newly arriving displaced students. It's difficult. Some classes have 100 students, some up to 140. That doesn't make it easy for the teachers, as you can see. There's hardly any room to move. The number of forcibly displaced people in northern Mozambique continues to grow. Eight organizations say they expect even more people to leave their homes in the coming days, fleeing the ongoing violence. African fashion is to get top billing at London's Victoria and Albert Museum for the first time in its 150-year history. An exhibition opening this weekend tells the story of the continent's clothing and its profound influence on global fashion, shining a spotlight on the best of its contemporary designers. African fashion is claiming its place on the world stage. After years of being viewed only through the post-colonial lens, the exhibition showcases the vibrant depth of African design, from the beginnings of the continent's liberation in the 1950s to the present day. On display are more than 250 objects, including the works of 45 designers from over 20 countries. As part of a wider push by the Victoria and Albert to acknowledge colonial histories within the museum, it's a timely show. It was really important and actually vital to have this exhibition right now because we see it's the African creatives that are shifting the landscape of global fashions. That's how important their impact is right now. So they demand to be seen, they demand to be heard, and we see their impact spilling out across global fashions. Preparations for the show took more than two years and included a public call out for rare designs, family portraits, and pieces of clothing connected to personal stories. Designers themselves were also involved in deciding how their pieces would be displayed. We really see fashion as a catalyst with which to tell deeper, richer, expanded stories about the myriad histories and cultures across the continent. And so we hope that our visitors will come away feeling inspired and perhaps some assumptions might be challenged as well. Creativity, ingenuity, and a multiplicity of traditions. From Morocco to Nigeria, Ghana to South Africa, Africa Fashion celebrates a continental fashion scene with unstoppable global impact. Sports Now and tennis legend Serena Williams has been knocked out in the first round of the Wimbledon Championship. The American had been out injured for a whole year and was making her singles comeback at the Grass Grand Slam. She lost in a final set, tiebreaker to France's Harmony Tan after a dramatic match. The 40-year-old Williams was targeting a record equaling 24th Grand Slam singles title. From the court to the pitch, the Soccer World Cup in Qatar is just five months away. For the first time, female referees will work at the men's tournament. Japan's Yoshimi Yamashita says she will feel the pressure when she steps out on soccer's biggest stage, but hopes to be very much in the background. Running into the unknown. A female referee has never taken charge of a men's World Cup football match before. But Japan's Yoshimi Yamashita hopes to do just that in Qatar in November. She is one of three women nominated as referees for the first World Cup in the Arab world. Despite the potential landmark, she wants to go largely unnoticed and is keen to let the football flow. One of the big targets for a referee is to bring out the beauty of the game. I will do my best to make that happen. If I need to communicate with the players, I will do that. If I need to show a card, I will show a card. But rather than control, I'm thinking about what I can do to boost the appeal of soccer. Qatar has been busy this week trying to show it as enough accommodation for the World Cup, including floating hotels, as prices soar. But the pressure is not just on the host nation, as Yamashita well knows. 
Of course, I think the pressure on me will be huge. I have a lot of responsibility. But I am really happy to take on this duty and the pressure. I try to take it as a positive and something which will make me happy. Male referees will still be in the majority in Qatar, but Yamashita will change football history. You're watching DW News live from Berlin. If you're just joining us, we are waiting for a news conference to begin with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Uh, that's at the Alliance's summit that's taking place right now in Madrid. Stoltenberg has billed the summit as a game changer that will alter the alliance for years to come. NATO leaders are expected to declare Russia as the main threat to their security. It was previously labored, labeled a strategic partner. Also, Finland and Sweden are being formally invited as members after Turkey dropped its opposition to them joining. Russian official warned that expansion would be stabilizing and that and it said that NATO was acting aggressively. We'll be bringing you Stoltenberg's news conference live when it does get underway, which we hope will be shortly. Well, earlier at the summit, the head of the alliance, Jan Stoltenberg, said the summit would change NATO again for years to come. Uh, we will um, agree the biggest overhaul of our collective defense deterrence since the end of the Cold War. And the U.S. is, of course, very much part of that. Um, and then we will invite Finland and Sweden to join NATO. And that demonstrates that NATO's door is open. Um, it demonstrates that uh, uh, President Putin has not succeeded in closing NATO's door. Uh, he is getting the opposite of what he wants. He wants less NATO. Uh, President Putin is getting more NATO by uh, Finland and Sweden joining our uh, alliance. So here's a quick look at NATO. Uh, currently, the North Atlantic Tre Treaty Organization, as its full name is, consists of 30 members. That includes the US, Canada, most of mainland Europe, the UK and Turkey. If Finland and Sweden join as expected, they would significantly bolster the alliance's northern flank. Both countries have cooperated with NATO in a limited fashion for almost 30 years now, and they bring additional military assets to the table. That includes Finland's more than 200,000 reservists and Sweden's submarine fleet. But Finland also shares a 1,300-kilometer border with the Russian Federation, and that could lead to additional tensions with Moscow. I spoke earlier to DW correspondent Terry Schultz. She's in Madrid covering the NATO summit for us. I asked Terry how Turkey was persuaded to drop its opposition to Finland and Sweden joining. We're not yet sure, Terry, exactly what happened behind the scenes. There's a lot of suspicion that the U.S. had something to do with it from afar, although they had said they wanted to stay out of it and make it very much a, a trilateral issue. But in the end, we have documents that are signed, so we know exactly what was agreed to yesterday between the three leaders. And President Erdogan is portraying this as a win for him. Finland and Sweden are saying, you know, we didn't really give away that much. But, but the main point is that... Finland and Sweden are declaring their support for Turkey. They will reinforce their efforts to counter terrorism. And for Turkey, that means against the PKK, which is a, a, a Kurdish organization that's already designated as a terrorist entity by the entire European Union. So, of course, these two countries as well. They will take into account Turkish information when looking at extradition requests. Uh, there are Kurdish people in Finland and Sweden that Turkey would very much like to have sent back. The, the Finnish and Swedish government aren't too keen on that. There will also be more movement on imports and exports of arms. Now, Finland in particular said it never had an arms embargo on Turkey, but that it would consider uh, both importing and exporting more weapons now once it becomes a NATO ally. So these are things that budge Turkey in the end. And as you can hear from all of these comments, they are very, very happy here at the NATO summit to be able to talk about unity instead of the headlines they otherwise would have been dealing with. Indeed, Terry, the deal on Sweden and Finland joining NATO has been widely welcomed within the, the alliance. Here's what U.S. President Joe Biden said earlier in his meeting with NATO's Secretary General. Putin was looking for the Finlandization of Europe. You're going to get the NATOization of Europe. And that's exactly what he didn't want, but exactly what needs to be done to guarantee security for Europe. And uh, I, think it's, uh, I, I think it's necessary, and I'm looking forward to it happening formally. 
President Biden there describing what he called the NATOization of Europe. And uh, NATO is, in fact, getting ready to announce what's being billed, Terry, as its biggest strategy, sh strategy shift since the end of the Cold War. Tell us what the main changes are underway. That's right. Uh, NATO will adopt at this meeting a 10-year plan looking into the future, but there will also be many practical changes. And the biggest among them is that the number of troops kept on high readiness will rise from 40,000 as it is today up to 300,000. That is a massive increase, and it will depend on all allies putting at NATO's uh, hands resources that uh, range from troops to to weapons and pre-positioning some of those resources in frontline countries. Uh, there are eight battle groups now uh, lining the eastern flank against Russia. And we will also see countries increase their funding above the 2% of GDP that is now the NATO aim. And President Biden, in fact, just announced a huge increase in, uh, in U.S. resources. And that is going to span not just the Eastern countries, but he, they're also going to be reinforcing in Germany, in Italy, in the UK. Very important for Poland. The US will put a permanent army headquarters there. Now, the word permanent has always been very touchy with NATO because it, there are, were agreements not to permanently station along Russia's border. That was blown away with, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, like so many other understandings. And uh, the US will also be reinforcing in Romania. And they're talking about thousands of troops. So this truly is going to be a historic summit in terms of how NATO is building up against what it now sees as a very persistent threat from Russia that's going to last for years to come. Terry, thank you so much for your reporting, and I look forward to talking to you throughout the day. That was our correspondent, Terry Schultz, there at the NATO summit in Madrid. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has urged the United Nations to expel Russia as a member and label it a terrorist state. He addressed the UN Security Council after a Russian missile struck a shopping mall, killing at least 18 people. Russia claims it did not target the mall, but fired on a weapons depot nearby. According to Ukraine, this was the moment a Russian missile hit, sparking a fire that left this shopping mall in Kremenchuk in ruins and dozens of people dead and missing. With rescue workers still picking through the rubble in the city far from the front lines, residents are in shock. Everything burned. Absolutely everything. Like a spark, I heard people screaming. I don't know how to describe it. It shocked me. It was horrible. It's terrible beyond words. How many people were there? Rush hour, people were returning from work, lots of shops. There were always a lot of people in Amstor. Targeted, I think. But Russia's defense ministry claims it didn't target the mall, saying it struck this nearby building instead. According to Moscow, it was ammunition being stored here exploding that started the fire. But both Ukrainian officials and locals denied there was a weapons depot in the area. No, no. residential buildings, a shopping centre, a football field, no military infrastructure. On Tuesday, President Zelensky urged the UN Security Council to take action in response to the attack. It is imperative to deprive Russia of the opportunity to manipulate the UN. It must be impossible for Russia to stay in the Security Council as long as its terrorism continues. But with Russia holding veto power on the Council, there's almost no chance of it facing consequences at the UN for the destruction and death here in Kremenchuk. I spoke to our correspondent, Nick Connolly, who's in uh, Kremenchuk earlier. I asked him to tell us more about the video released by the Ukrainian government that it says shows the moment the missile struck them all. So that video, which seemingly comes from a security camera, shows a missile hitting. In the foreground, you see some industrial equipment stored. We haven't been able to get there yet. We're hoping to get there in the next few hours to see the direction from which it was filmed to make sure that fits the geography here. But certainly, if you talk to people here on the ground, locals, they point to the pattern of destruction behind me of this shopping mall. One side basically fully collapsed, 
they say that's the impact, whereas the other side burnt out. The Russian version is that a fire spread from the factory behind this mall and that it you know, spread to the, to the mall by mistake through detonation maybe of some of those weapons. The Ukraine side dismisses that and points to the fact that there is quite some gap between the area of the factory that was hit and this mall, that those flames wouldn't have spread. So this is now a question of fact-checking. Lots of journalists on the ground trying to do those uh, calculations, get that information to be able to challenge those narratives. It is also important to point out that the Russians are coming out with lots of different and mutually conflicting versions of what, what went on here. Some pro-Russian media, Russian government media talking about attack on the oil refinery, which is 10 kilometers away. Others talking about an attack on the train station, which wasn't hit, that is also not far away. And then finally, some Russian top diplomats talking about Ukraine attacking itself to try and get sympathy and support internationally. So lots yeah. of different narratives coming out of Moscow, conflicting narratives and um, seemingly, uh, yeah, an attempt to try and obscure what actually went on when went on here. Nick, we've seen several missile strikes uh, with deep inside Ukraine over the past week. The attack on that mall in Kremenchuk is the most deadly. How are people in Ukraine reacting to all this? Well, definitely it is shocking. It is scary for people who maybe thought that they are in some kind of safety here, hundreds of kilometers from the front lines. Definitely now where the fighting has kind of localized itself along the front lines and the attack on the rest of the country that we saw in the early part of this war has largely finished. But this is obviously a reminder that those air raid warnings are crucial, even if it's very inconvenient. Every day, basically, you have a couple of hours where those air raid warnings are in place. And most people trying to go about their daily lives, trying to earn a living, are just not able to actually spend all that time down in a cellar or hiding somewhere. But this is obviously you know, a painful reminder that if you ignore those warnings, that this is the risk and that there is no part of Ukraine's territory that is out of range of these long-range Russian cruise missiles. The Russian news agency TASS uh, announced that the Russian-controlled region of Kherson has begun preparations for a referendum on joining Russia proper. Could that mean, Nick, that Russia is planning to annex more Ukrainian territory? It definitely looks like that. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the war, you'll remember the Russians said that this was not their intention. They said that they were not uh, interested in occupying biting bits off of Ukraine, that this was about denazifying Ukraine, whatever that means, and demilitarizing Ukraine. Now that is all long forgotten, and it seems like they are now trying to hand out Russian passports in these areas and you know, hold some kind of referendum like they did in Crimea in 2014, a referendum that wasn't recognized by anyone outside Russia as fair or free to try and justify taking that territory. Now, we don't have much more detail in terms of the timings when this is going to happen, but this is definitely a threat from Moscow, not only to Kiev, but also to the West. That Russia is willing to escalate. And if, obviously, then Ukraine tries to take those territories that Russia considers its own, then Russia might end up using nuclear weapons to defend them. So definitely willingness to escalate, at least in terms of the rhetoric from Moscow, very much in evidence. Nick, thank you very much. Our correspondent, Nick Connolly, there in Kremenchuk, Ukraine. Germany and the Netherlands have announced they'll send six additional howitzer artillery units to Ukraine. That's on top of the 12 dispatched last week. Germany also trained Ukrainian army personnel to use the weapons. Ukraine has welcomed the delivery, though some say the howitzers have come too late. Here's a close-up look at the new weaponry being deployed on the front lines in Ukraine. We make our way through bushes on Ukraine's eastern front line. In the middle of a patch of woods stands a howitzer tank from Germany. It's the first time the Ukrainian army has taken journalists here. This Ukrainian soldier just returned from Germany days ago. For more than a month, he was trained there. The time pressure for the troops is enormous because the Russian army is advancing further in the east. Many feel the arrival of these howitzers is long overdue. I think it's too late, much too late. Why? We should have been prepared before February 24th. It was known that the Russians would attack us. They'll never leave us alone. We should have been prepared in time. For weeks, they've been fighting a losing battle. One of the soldiers shows us a video of their operations with completely outdated technology. But that's about to change. Twelve howitzers have now arrived in Ukraine, seven from Germany and five from the Netherlands. Their location remains top secret. 
No matter in which army of the world, artillery is the first target for the enemy to eliminate, because this technology is especially dangerous for them. There's not much we're allowed to show on the front line this morning. The German army has told Ukraine that even the inside of the howitzer tank needs to remain a secret. They asked us not to film inside. They were afraid that the information about the technology would fall into the invaders' hands. On the tank, a provocative message to any Russian troops they may meet. That, too, is part of warfare. Take a look at some other stories making headlines today. Authorities in the Philippines have ordered the shutdown of an investigative news website founded by Nobel Peace Prize laureate Maria Ressa. Ressa and her outlet Rappler have repeatedly faced legal action over their criticism of outgoing President Rodrigo Duterte. Ressa said she would challenge the order in court. Indian police are on alert after the killing of a Hindu man in northern Rajasthan state. Protesters condemned the murder of a tailor by two Muslim men who filmed the crime and posted it online. Federal investigators are treating the killing as a terrorist incident. Restaurants in China's commercial hub, Shanghai, are reopening after the city's two-month coronavirus lockdown. Officials say diners have to present a negative PCR test taken within 72 hours, and patrons' dining time is restricted to 90 minutes. In Washington, a former White House aide has given dramatic testimony about Donald Trump's actions when rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol building. The aide said Trump knew protesters were armed and tried to seize control of a vehicle to drive to the Capitol. She was speaking at ongoing hearings into the events of January 6th last year. And then raise her right hand. Having previously sat for four closed-door depositions, this former White House aide was about to throw a political grenade into the select committee investigating Donald Trump's role in the storming of the U.S. Capitol. You may be seated. Cassidy Hutchinson told the hearing White House officials had been warned about potential violence and that Donald Trump was aware rioters were armed when they arrived in Washington, D.C. Ms. Hutchinson, is it your understanding that Mr. Ornato told the president about weapons at the rally on the morning of January 6th? That's what Mr. Ornato relayed to me. What followed was an excoriating account of an enraged president on the day of the Capitol siege. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Engel. And Mr. when Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. He's there are more hearings to follow in the coming weeks. But this is the closest the investigation has come to the inner workings of the White House on January 6th, the day American democracy came close to collapse. In Texas, three men have been charged in connection with the deaths of 51 people who were found dead in an abandoned tractor trailer. The victims included migrants from Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. U.S. President Joe Biden said the deaths were horrifying and heartbreaking. DW's Washington bureau chief, Ines Paul, sent this report from the scene of the tragedy near the city of San Antonio on a route frequently used for people smuggling. Two water bottles, part of a spontaneous memorial honoring the migrants who were found dead in a trailer on this remote street just out of San Antonio. 50 people died of heat stroke and dehydration, making this one of the deadliest border incidents in recent history. But it's not the first tragedy here, just 240 kilometers from Mexico. I feel sad, you know, because those people come to USA to look for their dreams, you know. 
and some people find them and some people not, but they they don't find that dream, you know. So they find them inside the, the trailer house, dead, you know. They come over here to the United States to make a better living, and they pay a lot of money to get here, and then people, you know, abuse them. Texas Governor Abbott put the blame squarely on the president, saying the tragedy was a result of Biden's open border policies. Technically, the border is still closed for most migrants, part of COVID restrictions that are still in place. President Biden finds himself in a difficult situation when it comes to migration policies. And this is dangerous for him because his challengers will make migration a central topic in the midterm election this November and also in the presidential elections in 2024. Let's take a look at some other stories making headlines around the world today. British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell has been sentenced to 20 years in prison for helping sex offender Jeffrey Epstein abuse teenage girls. Maxwell was convicted on five charges, including recruiting, grooming, and trafficking underage girls. Her lawyer said she will appeal the sentencing. Two suspects have been shot dead and several officers injured in Western Canada after armed men entered a bank in British Columbia. Officials said no employees, customers or members of the public were hurt in the incident. The area has been evacuated over fears of explosives. It's now been seven years since Paris was struck by one of Europe's worst Islamist terror attacks, which killed 130 people. All but one of the suspected terrorists died at the Bataclan Concert Hall and other locations around Paris. Today, a court is expected to deliver its verdict against the sole living accused attacker, Salah Abdesalam. DW met some of the survivors who are following his trial closely. For the past 10 months, Catherine Bertrand felt she was in a parallel universe. She's a survivor of the Bataclan attack and still traumatized by that night's events. Now she has been attending the trial and sketching portraits of those testifying, including some unsung heroes. While listening to the civil plaintiffs, I realized how these terror attacks have impacted the lives of thousands of people. One police officer, Michel, arrived with his team at the Bataclan just after the attack began. They got everyone who was wounded outside. Then, special forces got there and told Michel and his colleagues to go direct the traffic, although they were covered in blood. It was only when he testified that people heard how Michel helped people that night. He and his colleagues had never got any acknowledgement from their bosses. The court case has been hearing how the terrorist killing spree unfolded across the French capital. Only one of the ten attackers who were in Paris that night survived, Salah Abdeslam. He's become a focal point of the trial. In the past, I couldn't draw the terrorists. I was so unwell after the attacks that my psychologist and I decided I should just see the attackers as monsters. So I illustrated Abdeslam as a suicide belt with a beard. But as the hearings went on, I got more and more desensitized and suddenly I found myself drawing Abdeslam's face. It's like this court case has finally made me accept that humanity includes the best and the worst. A new courtroom was especially built for the mammoth trial, which has been symbolically important for France, says Arthur de Nouveau, himself a Bataclan survivor and head of one of the victims' associations. Through this trial, France has proven its strength, that its legislation, even before 2015, is sound enough to judge what happened that night. The court case really has shown that terrorism is a dead end and doesn't produce heroes. That might seem obvious, but some youngsters are still attracted to Islamic terrorism. I hope this will make everybody understand that there's no future in terrorism and such attacks need to stop. The end of the trial is an important step for everybody involved, not just because of the verdict. Those who are deeply implicated in the attack, such as Salah Abdeslam, need to get a harsh sentence. 
But the end of the court case also means I can finally be able to stop being a victim. I'll be able to turn to other things. That's a big step forward. What happened that night at the Bataclan will always stay a part of Catherine. But some of that weight on her shoulder is now finally going to fall away. To northern Mozambique now, and a spate of jihadist-related violence that has displaced some 20,000 people just this month. Islamists have been attacking villages in part of the Cabo Delgado region that were considered safe from such strikes for a long time. The region is rich in oil and gas, but investments worth billions have now been put on hold. Here's more from DW correspondent Adrian Kriesch. They just want to leave. Here in Ancoabe district, hundreds of people are waiting for a lift, desperate to get to safety after several villages were attacked by Islamists in recent weeks. Many places are now deserted. The village of Muaja on the edge of the district has been spared until now. Residents are discussing what to do next. We need to protect ourselves better. We need to check the identity of the people coming here. But we also want to welcome those people who are fleeing and take care of them. They have taken in 60 people from neighboring villages so far. They attacked our village. First they set fire to the villages close by. We were surrounded, but then we saw a chance to escape. So we ran. We survived, but they burned our houses to the ground. I'm just tired. My feet are swollen and hurt. We walked 30 kilometers to get here. We walked for three days, spent the night in the bush with our children. We are tired, but we feel much safer here. Until now, they have not received any support from the government. The insurgents have been pushed out their previous strongholds in the north of the province. And although observers say they are not as strong as previously, the attacks on villages around here is causing fear and panic. They are inflicting guerrilla-style warfare on communities that were previously considered safe. The attacks they took place in... Eight organizations fear that the conflict could spread. We were surprised that the conflict moved to the south that quick. If more population are moving to different places, you know, it's going to be more complex, I think. Yes, the capacity of the system is going to be, well, we will see. But I think, yes, we will, we will face some, some issues there. The largest secondary school in Montepuech is already at full capacity. Since the beginning of the crisis, the number of students here has doubled to 7,000. The school management has had to turn away newly arriving displaced students. It's difficult. Some classes have 100 students, some up to 140. That doesn't make it easy for the teachers, as you can see. There's hardly any room to move. The number of forcibly displaced people in northern Mozambique continues to grow. Eight organizations say they expect even more people to leave their homes in the coming days, fleeing the ongoing violence. To sports now, where tennis legend Serena Williams has been knocked out in the first round of the Wimbledon Championship. The American had been out injured for a whole year and was making her singles comeback at the Grass Grand Slam. She lost in a final set tiebreaker to Frances Harmony Tan after a dramatic match. The 40-year-old Williams was targeting a second, a record equaling 24th Grand Slam singles title. You are watching DW News live from Berlin. I'm Terry Martin. We are waiting this moment for a news conference with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg to begin at the Alliance's summit taking place in Madrid. Stoltenberg has billed the summit as a game changer that will alter the alliance for years to come. NATO leaders are expected to declare Russia as the main threat to their security. 
It was previously labeled a strategic partner. Also, Finland and Sweden are being formally invited as members after Turkey dropped its opposition. A Russian official warned that expansion would be destabilizing to international affairs and said NATO was acting aggressively. We'll be bringing you Stoltenberg's news conference live when it gets underway. We hope that's going to happen momentarily. Well, earlier at the summit, Jens Stoltenberg said the summit would change NATO for the near future and the medium term as well. Uh, we will um, agree the biggest overhaul of our collective defense deterrence since the end of the Cold War. And the U.S. is, of course, very much part of that. Um, and then we will invite Finland and Sweden to join NATO. And that demonstrates that NATO's door is open. Um, it demonstrates that uh, uh, President Putin has not succeeded in closing NATO's door. Uh, he is getting the opposite of what he wants. He wants less NATO. Uh, President Putin is getting more NATO by Finland and Sweden joining our uh, alliance. Well, to talk more about this, I'm joined here in the studio by DW's chief political correspondent, Melinda Crane. Melinda uh, Stoltenberg there, speaking of the biggest overhaul of NATO uh, since the end of the Cold War. What are we talking about? What's going to change? Well, really three points. First of all, an absolutely revitalized sense of purpose for this alliance. If you remember just a few years ago, we were debating whether NATO would survive in the face of Donald Trump's indifference, uh, his statement that NATO had become irrelevant and obsolete. Uh, there were real concerns that the U.S. might withdraw from the alliance. And now, of course, we are, as uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg says, seeing a lot more NATO rather than less. And that's the second point. Uh, when Finland and Sweden become members, and that will take some months, that doesn't simply happen today, but when they do, then the Baltic Sea, right there next to Russia, becomes a NATO sea, with essentially most of the states along its perimeter being NATO member and members. That is a profound change in European geopolitics. And then thirdly, uh, we are seeing NATO now, today, issue a new strategic concept. It does do this regularly every 10 years or so. But this one is fundamentally different from the last one. The last one actually talked about Russia as a potential strategic partner. This one will will identify Russia as NATO's prime adversary. For the first time, it will make very clear mention of China as a systemic rival. And in fact, NATO has even invited uh, some very important uh, Indo-Pacific countries to join it there in uh, and, and essentially be at this summit to talk about China's role geopolitically. So those are three very big shifts for this very important transatlantic body. This has huge implications, what NATO is now preparing, the changes that you just mentioned, Melinda. By the way, we are looking at live pictures from the venue where we hope that press conference with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg will be getting underway shortly. But these changes that uh, you just described for us, Melinda, that are taking place within NATO, we're going to hear more about that in this press conference, we hope. Um, these changes have significant implications for the security architecture within Europe. Uh, they have major implications because of the war in Ukraine, uh, particularly if Finland joins NATO. That's a 1,300 kilometer long border with Russia that will obviously raise, uh, raise Russia's eyebrows at the very least and could put it into a completely different defense posture. Indeed, Russian Defense Minister, uh, the Deputy Defense Minister today was saying that R NATO expansion is a purely destabilizing factor, that's a quote, in international affairs. How might Russia respond to this, Melinda? Well, interestingly enough, when the possibility of Finnish and Swedish membership was first broached, we heard some pretty harsh rhetoric out of Russia, calling it a direct threat to Russia and essentially implying that Russia might have to take some kind of action. That rhetoric was toned down significantly around mid-May when Vladimir Putin said, 
We don't have any problems with Finland and Sweden. These are not countries with which we have disputes, by which he seems to mean especially territorial disputes, as he does have with Ukraine, and therefore implying that uh, Russia would possibly accept this with a certain equanimity. Now, of course, those remarks today uh, indicate uh, definitely some dissatisfaction, uh, but the, the speaker resolved, reserved his harshest words actually for the prospect that NATO would creep closer and closer to Crimea. He said there, in that case, Russia would definitely see a very direct threat that could potentially lead to a NATO-Russian conflict. So he's still, in terms of Finland and Sweden, holding back from the kind of harsh rhetoric we heard initially. I think Russia now sees that this is going to happen. So, um, yeah, perhaps toning it down a bit. The Ukraine war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February 24th changed everything. The, we keep hearing that again and again. We heard German Chancellor Olaf Scholz at the G7 summit yesterday also saying that things can never go back to the way they were with Russia after that invasion. Germany has announced a, a massive boost in military spending, a 100 billion euro special fund. Uh, Germany is now going to meet or exceed the 2% NATO spending target. Other uh, NATO members within Europe are also beefing up their defense budgets. But the United States, Melinda, still remains the main guarantor of security in Europe. It was hoping to shift its concentration to the Pacific to deal with China, it was hoping that, that NATO that NATO members within Europe would begin to take more responsibility for their own security. Is this was supposed to be factored into the new NATO strategy yeah, that no. will be presented today. That must be in tatters now, that original Absolutely. planning. We heard a very different plan now from Joe Biden uh, speaking this morning at the NATO summit, saying that the U.S. is now planning, for example, to establish its first permanent headquarters on NATO's eastern flank, namely in Poland. The U.S will considerably beef up its presence, essentially, from the UK to Germany, Spain, Romania, the Balkans, the Baltics. So looking at far more, again, not, not less U.S., but more U.S. And as you mentioned, uh, there's an ongoing tension within the United States about uh, the degree to which there should be a pivot to Asia, to China, and also the degree to which the U.S. should still be engaging in foreign wars and foreign entanglements. So this posture will not do, be to the liking of uh, many people at home, but Joe Biden is very, very resolute. This is where the U.S. is going. And the U.S. in many ways has been driving NATO unity during the war on Ukraine uh, with a really very consistent attempt to, to keep NATO member countries uh, on the same line. Uh, warm praise yesterday for the German chancellor at the, uh, the uh, G7 summit, although Germany has not always stepped up to the plate to the gr degree that many NATO and EU uh, fellow members uh, would like. Nonetheless, uh, again, uh, President Biden saying Germany has really turned things around and that 2% commitment uh, to defense spending. Indeed, Germany has never fulfilled that goal that it did sign up to until now, but this new fund will ensure that it does so. So as you say, there are massive changes on many fronts, but what we can say is that the U.S. presence and the U.S. commitment to the alliance are a constant, at least as long as this president is in power. Okay, Melinda, uh, thank you for now. We're going to go back to some of our regular broadcasting uh, while we continue to wait for the press conference to begin there at the NATO summit in Madrid with the Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. You're watching DW News from Berlin. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has urged the United Nations to expel Russia as a member and label it a terrorist state. He addressed the UN Security Council after a Russian missile struck a shopping mall, killing at least 18 people. Russia claims it did not target the mall, but fired on a weapons depot nearby. According to Ukraine, this was the moment a Russian missile hit, sparking a fire that left this shopping mall in Kremenchuk 
in ruins and dozens of people dead and missing. With rescue workers still picking through the rubble in the city far from the front lines, residents are in shock. Everything burned, absolutely everything. Like a spark, I heard people screaming. I don't know how to describe it. It shocked me. It was horrible. It's terrible beyond words. How many people were there? Rush hour, people were returning from work, lots of shops. There were always a lot of people in Amstor. Targeted, I think. But Russia's defense ministry claims it didn't target them all, saying it struck this nearby building instead. According to Moscow, it was ammunition being stored here exploding that started the fire. But both Ukrainian officials and locals denied there was a weapons depot in the area. No, no. residential buildings, a shopping center, a football field, no military infrastructure. On Tuesday, President Zelensky urged the UN Security Council to take action in response to the attack. It is imperative to deprive Russia of the opportunity to manipulate the UN. It must be impossible for Russia to stay in the Security Council as long as its terrorism continues. But with Russia holding veto power on the Council, there's almost no chance of it facing consequences at the UN for the destruction and death here in Kremenchuk. Earlier, I spoke to DW correspondent Nick Connolly, who's in Kremenchuk. I asked him to tell us more about that video released by the Ukrainian government that purports to show the moment the missile struck the mall. So that video, which seemingly comes from a security camera, shows a missile hitting. In the foreground, you see some industrial equipment stored. We haven't been able to get there yet. We're hoping to get there in the next few hours to see the direction from which it was filmed to make sure that fits the geography here. But certainly, if you talk to people here on the ground, locals, they point to the pattern of destruction behind me of this shopping mall. One side basically fully collapsed. They say that's the impact, whereas the other side burnt out. The Russian version is that a fire spread from the factory behind this mall and that it you know, spread to the, to the mall by mistake through detonation maybe of some of those weapons. The Ukrainian side dismisses that and points to the fact that there is quite some gap between the area of the factory that was hit and this mall, that those flames wouldn't have spread. So this is now a question of fact-checking, lots of journalists on the ground trying to do those uh, calculations, get that information to be able to challenge those narratives. It is also important to point out that the Russians are coming out with lots of different and mutually conflicting versions of what went on here. Some pro-Russian media, Russian government media, talking about attack on the oil refinery, which is 10 kilometers away. Others talking about an attack on the train station, which wasn't hit, that is also not far away. And then finally, some Russian top diplomats talking about Ukraine attacking itself to try and get sympathy and support internationally. So lots yeah. of different narratives coming out of Moscow, conflicting narratives, and um, seemingly, uh, yeah, an attempt to try and obscure what actually went on when went on here. Nick, we've seen several missile strikes uh, with deep inside Ukraine over the past week. The attack on that mall in Kremenchuk is the most deadly. How are people in Ukraine reacting to all this? Well, definitely it is shocking. It is scary for people who maybe thought that they are in some kind of safety here, hundreds of kilometers from the front lines. Definitely now where the fighting has kind of localized itself along the front lines and the attack on the rest of the country that we saw in the early part of this war has largely finished. But this is obviously a reminder that those air raid warnings are crucial, even if it's very inconvenient. Every day, basically, you have a couple of hours where those air raid warnings are in place. And most people trying to go about their daily lives, trying to earn a living, are just not able to actually spend all that time down in the cellar or hiding somewhere. And we are going to cut straight over to Jens Stoltenberg, the head of the uh, NATO Secretary General. Has created the biggest security crisis in Europe since the Second World War. NATO has responded with strength and unity. And President Zelensky's leadership and courage are an inspiration to all of us. I am pleased that he could join our meeting uh, today. President Zelensky made clear that Ukraine relies on our continued support 
and our message to him was equally clear. Ukraine can count on us for as long as it takes. Allies will continue to provide a major military and financial help. And today, leaders agreed to strengthen uh, our support uh, by agreeing a comprehensive assistance package for Ukraine. This includes um, secure communications, fuel, medical supplies and body armor, equipment to counter mines and chemical and biological threats, and hundreds of portable anti-drone systems. Over the longer term, we will help Ukraine transition from Soviet-era equipment to modern NATO equipment, boost interoperability, and further strengthen its defense and security institutions. All of this shows our commitment to Ukraine's future and that our commitment is unshakable. A strong, independent Ukraine is vital for the stability of the Euro-Atlantic area. Today, at the summit, NATO leaders decided a fundamental shift in our defense and deterrence to respond to a new security reality. We will strengthen our forward defenses. We will enhance our battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance up to brigade levels. We will transform the NATO response force and increase the number of high readiness forces to well over 300,000. We will also boost our ability to reinforce, including with more pre-positioned equipment and stockpiles of military supplies, more forward deployed capabilities like air defense, strengthen command and control, and up graded defense plans with forces pre-assigned to defend specific allies. This is the first time since the Cold War that we have these kind of uh, plans with uh, pre-assigned forces. They will work uh, with home defense forces and uh, become familiar with local terrain, facilities, and pre-positioned stocks so that we can reinforce even faster. Doing more will cost more. Today, Allies recommitted to the pledge we made in 2014 to spend at least 2% of GDP on defense. Since 2014, European Allies and Canada have spent an extra 350 billion US dollars. Nine allies now reach or exceed the 2% target. 19 allies have clear plans to reach it by 2024. And an additional five have concrete commitments to meet it thereafter. 2% is increasingly seen as a floor, not as a ceiling. Allies are also investing more in modern capabilities contributing more to NATO deployments and exercises, and we have agreed to increase NATO's common funding to finance, to finance the facilities we need for reinforcement, as well as more training and more exercises, command and control, and engagement with partners. We face a radical change uh, to our security environment and strategic competition is rising around the world. So today, leaders have endorsed NATO's new strategic concept. And uh, it is uh, published as we speak. And this is uh, the new strategic concept. The current one was agreed in 2010. And this is very different compared to what we agreed back uh, then. It makes clear uh, that Russia's, Russia poses the most significant and direct threat to our security. In the current concept, we state that uh, Russia is a strategic partner. Uh, in the current concept, we do not mention China with a single word. 
In this, uh, allies states that uh, China's coercive policies challenge our interests, security, and values. The concept also sets out our joint position on countering terrorism, as well as cyber and hybrid threats. Today, we took other important steps to continue our adaptation. We are launching the NATO Innovation Fund, backed by allies. It will invest 1 billion euros in startups and funds uh, developing dual-use emerging technologies, such as artificial intelligence. Together with NATO's Defense Innovation Accelerator uh, for the North Atlantic, or DIANA, the new fund uh, will harness the best new technology for transatlantic security. Climate change is a defining challenge of our time, and NATO is committed to playing our part in mitigating the impact on our security. <coughs> Sorry. Today, we agreed a new methodology to map military greenhouse gas emissions, and we agreed concrete targets to cut NATO emissions. Our aim is to cut emissions by NATO bodies and commands by at least 45% by 2030, and move towards net zero by 2050. This is an important step for our alliance. We cannot choose between having green militaries or strong militaries. They must be both. So we must maintain our operational effectiveness and readiness as we continue to adapt. In a more dangerous and competitive world, we must work even more closely with like-minded uh, nations and organizations. This afternoon, our Indo-Pacific partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea, will take part in a NATO summit for the first time. We will also be joined by the European Union, Finland, Georgia, and Sweden. Today, NATO leaders took the historic decision to invite Finland and Sweden to become members of NATO. The agreement concluded last night by Turkey, Finland, and Sweden paved the way for this decision. I would like to thank Turkey, Finland, and Sweden for accepting my invitation uh, to engage in negotiations to find a united way forward. This has been hard work over many weeks, with multiple contacts at many different levels. Senior officials have had two rounds of talks in Brussels under my auspices. And last night, we met President Erdogan, President Ninesto, and Prime Minister Andersson, and we were able to reach the final agreement. This is a good agreement for Turkey. It is a good agreement for Finland and Sweden. And it is a good agreement for NATO. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, we'll start with CNN. Thank you so much. Um, so I have two questions. The first is, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about the meetings you've had over the day about ironing out the details of the new force model, and that includes the question of um, permanent basing. And I'm wondering, you know, Putin has said that Finland and Sweden's membership bids don't pose a direct threat to Russia but he has also warned them about becoming bases for NATO forces or equipment. So I'm wondering whether NATO has any plans to put permanent bases in those countries now that they've been formally invited into the alliance. First of all, the decision to invite Finland and Sweden to become members demonstrates that NATO's door is open. It demonstrates that President Putin, Putin did not succeed in closing NATO's door. NATO's door remains open. And it also demonstrates that we respect the sovereign right of every nation to choose their own path. So we, of course, respected Finland and Sweden when they decided to uh, stay out of NATO for many, many years. 
but then we also welcome them and respect their decision to join NATO. Uh, NATO allies have already uh, stepped up, and NATO has increased its presence uh, uh, in the uh, Baltic Nordic region. Um, and of course, as when they become members, we can do even more together. What we will make sure uh, with uh, our presence is that we are able to defend all allies, uh, including, uh, of course, Finland and uh, Sweden. Um, and this links to the first part of the question. When it comes to this fundamental shift in our deterrence and defense, this is about air, sea, land, cyber. But when we speak about land, uh, that entails or is composed of three main elements. Partly more forward presence. We will um, um, enhance, reinforce the battle groups we have already deployed up to brigade levels. So that's more presence, especially in the eastern part of the alliance. The second element is more pre-positioned equipment. We know that actually to move people can go quite fast, but to move heavy equipment, um, battle tanks, ammunition, fuel, all kinds of supplies, that take time. So if you have that pre-positioned in place, then you can move in very quickly with the personnel. So the second element on top of the increased presence will be more pre-positioned equipment. And then on top of that, we will have for the first time since the Cold War pre-assigned forces in, of course, their home countries. But these forces will then rotate in and out. They will train. They will learn how to operate together with the uh, home forces, for instance, in the Baltic countries or in Poland uh, or other places in the alliance. Uh, they will uh, be familiar with the train, with the pre-positioned equipment. Uh, and for instance, one uh, example of this is what Germany just has announced, that they are now pre-assigning, designating a specific brigade in Germany that will train and, of course, uh, work together with the older German battle group in Lithuania uh, and with more pre-positioned equipment. Then this German brigade has a specific responsibility and, uh, uh, and, and I would say advantages because they have trained there and, and know the um, the, 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 the country to reinforce and support uh, Lithuania if needed. So these are the three elements. Uh, you can also look at the NATO homepage. You can see more details there, uh, there in the fact sheet. Uh, and then, of course, the announcement by different allies today uh, makes it, um, also is actually giving uh, substance to the decisions that allies made today. Interfax Ukraine. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, Interfax Ukraine. Happy birthday, Juana. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you from all of my colleagues for everything you are doing for us. Sorry, Secretary General. Question for you. Coming back to President Zelensky's address, what kind of reaction was from leaders in the room? Can you give a little bit more on this? What will be the main message to Ukrainian people? Do you think it will be possible for Ukraine then when this war will be over? to join NATO like Sweden and Finland without membership action plan. Thank you. Well, the message from the leaders uh, in the meeting and in the room was a very strong expression of support. Uh, and not only expression of support, but actually they announced additional uh, systems, weapons, equipment that uh, allies, NATO allies, are now delivering to Ukraine. Uh, um, Germany made announcements. Um, um, uh, Norway made announcements and other countries made announcements for additional um, uh, support, military support to Ukraine. The Netherlands also uh, uh, made announcements on, uh, on more heavy weapons uh, uh, to, to Ukraine. Um, so uh, part of this is something we do, uh, it's also as a message in deeds, but also in words, but also in deeds. Uh, but I think also it's very clear that allies are prepared for long haul. Uh, it, War, war, wars are unpredictable, uh, but we have to be prepared for the long haul. And uh, that, was also, that was also the clear message to uh, all of us in the room from President Zelensky. And our answer was, yes, we are prepared. Uh, because um, they are fighting for their independence, but they're also fighting for values which are important for NATO, fundamental for NATO. Uh, the sovereignty, uh, uh, the territorial integrity of every uh, nation, 
uh, and, uh, and therefore this matters for our security. Um, our focus now is to support Ukraine. Um, this war will, as most other wars, at some, some st stage end at the negotiating table. Uh, but it is important that uh, Ukraine is able to get an agreement on their terms, which is acceptable for Ukraine. And therefore, we know that there is a very close link between what they can achieve around the negotiating table and uh, their strength on the battlefield. And therefore, our focus now is to support them on the battlefield with many different types of lethal and non-lethal support. That is the uh, focus. Uh, and then, of course, we have demonstrated today that NATO's door remains open. Uh, and, and we also reiterate the uh, decision we made in Bucharest uh, on membership for Ukraine. Spanish television. Mr. Secretary General. Mr. Secretary General. Welcome to Madrid. Uh, you don't have a crystal ball, but I was uh, wondering how much longer do you think it's going to take for Finland and uh, Sweden to join the NATO since it's a pretty urgent situation? Thank you very much. Well, so far, this is uh, the fastest uh, accession protocol ever, uh, accession process ever, um, uh, because uh, uh, Finland and Sweden applied for membership in May, and now, uh, at the end of the June, uh, leaders invite them to become members, and we will sign uh, the accession protocol, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then what remains, of course, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, the ratification in 30 parliaments. Uh, I cannot speak on behalf or promise anything on behalf of 30 different parliaments, but the message in the room uh, is that uh, throughout the alliance there is a strong will to uh, work with parliaments so they can do the uh, ratification as soon as possible. So uh, this, uh, this has moved fast so far, and of course I expect that the allies are ready to also ratify as soon as possible, but there are different procedures in different countries, so this will take some time in different parliaments. Global News Canada. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. David Aiken, Global News. Um, you were very gracious uh, greeting the Canadian Prime Minister today. Secretary General, before you have been very gracious greeting Canadian Prime Ministers. But our spending is just awful. Uh, it decreased, if you measure by GDP, it decreased in absolute terms. We're nowhere near the 2%. It's not your place, but I wonder how might you convince a Canadian public, a Canadian politician, to spend more on defense, and secondarily, what then might a medium or smaller military power do, contribute, with some of this new focus, new spheres of influence in China, in Asia, as well as the urgent crisis here in uh, Europe? Thank you. Of course, I expect all allies to meet the guidelines we have set, uh, and we agreed them back in 2014 for the decade up to 2024, uh, and since then the world has just become more dangerous. And, and I have been a politician myself for many years, and I understand that it's always easier to invest in health, in education, in infrastructure, instead of allocating money for defense. That's very easy to understand. Uh, and that, that's also the reason why NATO allies reduced defense spending after the end of the Cold War. Uh, but if we reduce defense spending when tensions are going down, we have to be able to increase defense spending when tensions are going up and when we, and when we live in a more dangerous world. And therefore, I welcome the fact that all NATO allies have increased defense spending and added a lot. Um, uh, uh, not all allies uh, have plans in place to be at 2% by 2024, but the vast majority have such plans, and more and more allies are actually meeting the 2% uh, target or are very close. So, of course, this is a message to all allies, including Canada. Uh, at the same time, also welcome the fact that Canada and other allies are providing a lot of uh, capabilities, um, contributions to NATO missions and operations, and Canada lead the, the battle group in Latvia. I've been there together with, 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 President, uh, with Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, and also with the Defence and the, and the, and the Foreign Minister, uh, and, and also welcome the fact that Canada is not stepping up its presence in Latvia, and of course this also counts a lot uh, when it comes to contributions to our collective defence. Thank you. That's, I'm afraid, all that we have time for. Secretary General needs to meet our Indo-Pacific partners. Secretary General. Thank you so much.
And that was NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg there uh, speaking at a news conference at the Alliance Summit taking place in Madrid. He introduced the new strategic concept for NATO, the first overhaul of its strategic concept. Uh, for 12 years, he mentioned that Ukraine can count on us, he said, count on NATO for as long as it takes, referring to the Ukraine war, of course. He said that... Uh, Strategic competition is increasing around the world, and he called on he called out China and Russia in particular. Uh, said they were mentioned in this new strategic concept, noting that Russia is the most significant and direct threat. Quote, and that China challenges the interests, security, and values of NATO. So let's get some analysis here. I'm joined here in the studio by DW's chief political correspondent, Melinda Crane, and our in-house NATO expert, Terry Schultz, is following the summit, joins us from Madrid. Terry, you've been covering NATO for a long time. We're looking at a massive overhaul of the alliance planned here. What are the key changes you picked up on? That's certainly true, Terry. And all of this, of course, was brought about by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So one of the biggest things we're going to see is the number of troops put on high readiness who could be called in to the eastern flank uh, if there is a direct threat to NATO territory. And the numbers are just staggering here. There's about 40,000 of those soldiers uh, now on high readiness. That's going to expand to more than 300,000. And all allies are expected to tell NATO's Supreme ally commander, what resources it has, how, how many troops it has of what type that could be sent you know, within three days, within 10 days, within 30 days, so that NATO is really not just putting more people out front, but preparing to backfill those needs for a long conflict like we're seeing now in Ukraine. The other thing that we're going to see is that there are going to be more troops sent right now within the next uh, six to 12 months to these eastern flank countries, as they've been asking for. You know, we've heard the Baltic states in particular request more boots on the ground. They're going to get some all along the eastern flank, ranging from Estonia all the way down through Bulgaria. Those, those eight battle groups are going to be increased uh, up to a brigade size. That could be double or triple, depending on the number of, of troops they have. Now there are going to be allies pre-assigned to rush to the aid of other allies. And this hasn't happened since the Cold War. So you're really seeing a huge, huge increase in NATO's force, what they're calling the, the new force posture. This, of course, is going to cost more, Terry, and they are also talking about more spending, well above the 2% of GDP goal that they have at the moment. So a, NATO, a massive increase in NATO's force posture. Uh, we also know that Finland mm -hmm. and Sweden have been formally invited to join NATO, another big step. Melinda, how important, how significant are these steps that we're hearing about now? These are the biggest strategic uh, changes that we have seen since the end of the Cold War, as the Secretary General pointed out. When Sweden and Finland become members of the alliance, then the Baltic Sea will become a largely NATO uh, sea in the sense that uh, much of its perimeter will uh, be uh, NATO member countries. And that is a massive uh, geopolitical shift here in Europe. President Zelensky of Ukraine said today to the assembled uh, NATO member countries that uh, he essentially is fighting for all of Europe and that Russia wants to reshape uh, the European order. And certainly the states in Eastern Europe on NATO's eastern flank and the Baltic states absolutely share that view and feel that they themselves are directly threatened by Russia's war on Ukraine, that Russia by no means would stop there if it believes that it has won the conflict in Ukraine. And for those reasons, we are seeing the shift that Terry just described is essentially a shift from what was called a, a, a tripwire posture, a deterrent posture, with those battle groups in key Baltic uh, countries, for example, essentially a kind of an 
early warning system that would then uh, trigger reinforcements and so on. Now there's a sense that that deterrent tripwire posture absolutely isn't sufficient to the level of threat that we're seeing and that it has to become a truly defense posture. So those pre-assigned forces that we heard him emphasizing, one of the reasons for that is that they will have trained with the home defense forces in those countries so that they can be effective the moment their boots hit the ground. So this is an absolutely major change also for the alliance in many ways a revitalization of the alliance's very posture because just a few years ago we were debating whether nato had become in some sense obsolete very different from now now the deal on sweden and finland joining nato has been welcomed within the alliance this will boost the alliance numbers from 30 to 32 by the way 32 countries will now be in the, uh, in the alliance when that has actually happened, when Finland and Sweden are taken on board. Earlier today, while speaking to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, the U.S. President Joe Biden had this to say about Sweden and Finland joining. Putin was looking for the Finlandization of Europe. You're going to get the NATOization of Europe. And that's exactly what he didn't want, but exactly what needs to be done to guarantee security for Europe. And uh, I think it's... Uh, I think it's necessary, and I'm looking forward to it happening formally. Yes, President Joe Biden there describing what he called the NATOization of Europe. And uh, NATO is indeed uh, billing these changes as the biggest strategic shift since the end of the Second World War. Terry, how do other members within NATO feel about this shift? Well, if you're talking to the Eastern allies, of course, they are very pleased. They've been asking for more forces, but it took truly Russia's invasion of Ukraine to make uh, the rest of the members of, of NATO really feel that this is in their own interest to reinforce the Baltic states, to reinforce Poland, um, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. Up until now, it was it was sort of, you know, perhaps... Um, not seen as necessary. Now everyone sees that if Russia is allowed to win in Ukraine, it will it will most likely set its sights on other countries and the closest countries to Russia, of course, many of them sharing a border, are the Baltic states, are Poland. And so NATO has really come to see this as a matter of its own defense. And and sadly, sadly enough to, that, that Ukraine is the buffer to, to the NATO countries right now. So that's another reason why uh, this NATO summit also announced a huge assistance package for, for Ukraine. And as you heard Secretary General Stoltenberg say, the, the, the allies are very much encouraging President Zelensky and saying that they will be here for as long as it takes to continue sending weapons to Ukraine, to send other assistance to Ukraine, to send moral support to Ukraine. But if you listen to the press conference, you also heard a Ukrainian journalist say, when are we going to become a member? And that is something still on the Ukrainians' minds. Melinda. Uh, with Finland and Sweden joining NATO, this is not going to happen immediately. There will be a transitional period until they formally become members of NATO, even though they've been invited to do so now, Jens Stoltenberg just announced. What about the interim? What about this time between now and when they actually become members of NATO? What's going to, how, how, what status are they going to have? It's a very important question because they only get that Article 5 protection, that collective defense protection, when they actually are members. So in this interim period, it seems that they are uh, going to be given uh, some forms of bilateral security guarantees, informal uh, assurances that uh, should anything happen, uh, other countries would uh, quickly uh, come uh, to their assistance. And, uh, and this interim period is nonetheless uh, a period in which uh, there could be a heightened risk. And therefore, Secretary General Stoltenberg has said uh, upon a number of occasions that 
NATO will absolutely be reinforcing uh, its uh, its presence in the air, in the in the, on the sea, uh, and on land to make sure that any threat is quickly uh, perceived, detected, and uh, and dealt with. So there will be a very staunch uh, surveillance, of course, in that time, and then, as as I said, uh, a commitment to try to assist these countries. It's also, of course, um, a time that's not entirely free of the possibility that some form of resistance uh, could then uh, uh, re 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 return. We saw Turkey trying to block uh, this membership uh, until yesterday evening when a deal was brokered. So it will be interesting to see whether you know this all now uh, does uh, stay in place uh, or where whether there's some bargaining uh, that goes on uh, in this interim period. But uh, Jens Stoltenberg has made it very, very clear that this is now going to happen. It is not an if, but simply a when. Melinda, thank you very much. Uh, our chief political correspondent, uh, Melinda Crane, here with me in the studio and in Madrid covering the NATO summit for us. Of course, Terry Schultz, our correspondent. Thank you very much to you both. Thank you. You are watching DW News Live from Berlin. Just a recap of our main story. NATO leaders have formally invited Sweden and Finland to join the military alliance at their summit in Madrid. NATO leaders also declared Russia to be the most significant and direct threat to their security. It was previously labeled as a strategic partner. A Russian official warned that expansion would be destabilizing to international affairs and said NATO was acting aggressively. Now to other but related news, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has urged the United Nations to expel Russia as a member and label it a terrorist state. He addressed the UN Security Council after a Russian missile attack uh, hit a shopping mall, killing at least 18 people. Russia claims it didn't target the mall but fired on a weapons depot nearby.